Hi, uh, I'm Terry Haber, and um, uh, System Administration and Linux Web Hosting Environment. I work for DreamHost, and I've been a system administrator there for um, over three years now. And in the beginning, when I first wor started working there, um, it was interesting because, you know, for my interview, they brought me into this, you know, small cage in a data center. We had maybe about a thousand web servers. And uh, that was seemed to be a lot. I was ooh, overawed. Now we have about three, uh, over 2,000 web, uh, servers in three data centers. So that's quite a bit. We were founded in 1997 by Dallas Kashuba, Josh Jones, Michael Rodriguez, and Sage Weil. And uh, we call them the honchos. And they started, uh, they were students at Harvey Mudd University in Claremont, California. And we, uh, they started with one uh, server, uh, it a, was a Pentium 100 computer named Destro. And it was under, hidden under a friend's desk. And it was, uh, they were using share, uh, shared bandwidth, it was, let's see, a T1 line <laughs> of all things. So they had no money, they were college students. So uh, again, uh, these were metrics, these are, you know, I just kind of queried our database for what machines we have active uh, at the time that I made these slides. Of course, we're going to have many more than, uh, quite a few more actually than this now. But uh, this kind of gives you the idea of the numbers that we've swollen to, which, uh, and managing all of this, of course, is quite interesting. So when, uh, when I say shared web hosting servers, I mean, um, usually, um, Historically, that has meant the One U Blade servers, uh, the physical servers that you know has the boot disk with Apache installed on it, uh, Perl, and you know the other goodies. But then, what we'll usually do, uh, what we did historically was uh, NFS mount the data from file servers uh, for customer data, because then all we'd have to do is if a physical server failed, we could just um, you know undo the uh, NFS mount or you know just redo the mounts to uh, a standby server. So the customers would be, uh, could be back up in like an hour. Uh, however, now we are migrating to 2U servers, uh, local file storage. Why Linux? Well, <laughs> I probably don't have to say you know, too much to you guys why we chose Linux, but uh, in, just to give you an idea of why we did. Uh, why we chose Linux. In the beginning, um, again, they were college students. Without Linux, there would be no dream host. Um, well, we like to do things our way. We like, we're a Debian house. We like to build our own packages. Uh, so we can do stuff like run um, 12 instances of Apache on one server. Um, so, I mean, we, you can't do that out of the box as far as I know with Apache, but, you know, we kind of alter things so that we can. Um, it's easier and inexpensive to add features, like uh, right now, we just recently started uh, DreamHost, uh, DreamHost PS, which is a virtual machine service. Uh, customers can get their own virtual machine, and that's based on Linux vServer. Uh, more profit to share, we are, um, are employee-owned, uh, so we all get profit sharing checks. <laughs> Well, those are always great. And of course, more fun. Um, I don't know. Everybody has their own um, operating system that they prefer, prefer to use. Uh, me, personally, I th uh, tinkering with Linux is a lot of fun. So uh, I'd like to get into some of the software tools that we use. Uh, PowerDNS, NetSaint, Subversion, you are probably uh, all familiar with those in one way or another. Service Control, Usage Watch, Web Panel. Uh, you might be unfamiliar with those, although, wait, do we have any customers in the house here? Any DreamHost customers? May I see some hands? Ooh, well, far fewer than us. Uh, those of you who are customers are going to be familiar with web panel, and I'm going to go into web panel just a little bit. Uh, PowerDNS. We use that. We used to use Bind uh, until about early 2006. Uh, Bind petered out at about 235,000 domains for us. The flat file system just did not work very well after that. And again, as you saw from a, a previous slide, we're now up to 780,000 domains. And those are compiled and uh, actually, you know, put into, uh, or actually work better if it's uh, on MySQL rather than flat files. So uh, we use six PDNS servers, three for backup, and four separate MySQL machines for DNS. And that includes, where am I? 
will master MySQL and three rep replicated slaves. So, oh, and by the way, that's right. Multi-threaded bind at the time wasn't available, or at least it wasn't working very uh, in a stable fashion at that time, because we looked into that and it just wasn't an option. I mean, we needed something. Yes. What version of bind was that? Pardon? I don't think it was even at eight at that point. I think it might have been earlier than eight. Eight was 2004. Then it must have been uh, eight, and we were waiting for nine, but we couldn't wait. There was nine. Nine was out at that time. Really? Yeah. Nine was 2001 or so. OK. Yeah, yeah, and if we um, and what we do is um, when somebody adds a domain to the uh, to their web panel, when they you know use web panel to uh, you know add a domain or or a subdomain or something, um, as it is, they have to wait 24 to 48 hours, of course, for everything to propagate. Which you know they're impatient as it is with that, but also to wait on top of that, we could only uh, update the zones like twice a day, and uh, we were looking at some really unhappy customers, which we never like. We use NetSaint, of course. Uh, we have to monitor our uh, servers 24-7 because um, with that many machines and with as many users as we have, it's guaranteed that somebody's going to be doing something that's going to be making the server, uh, server unhappy somewhere, whether it's a shared hosting server or a MySQL server. Uh, so we have NetSaint monitoring 24-7. We work in shifts. All of us participate in monitoring, uh, including some higher level uh, tech support people. Yes? Is that, um, I'm not familiar with the design, but does it work by, um, you know, if you have agents running on the, the machine sending alerts to the monitoring system? Or not your staff. Sorry? Or not your staff. Oh, okay. Oh. So, so is, is the system uh, that you have agents running on the individual machine sending, um, sending uh, traps or something to your... Uh. Semi, we, we have like a config file uh, on each server that actually says, you know, what, um, uh, you know, what checks that can be run locally, like it'll, it'll actually, it actually uh, has con um, commands in there, like for example, what to, you know, like for disk usage or for uh, server load, and the, um, and there's a, a um, we have several NetSaint servers or NGO servers that will, you know, grab that data, you know, from the, from the, you know, from the host. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and um, that information is all sent to a mailing list, and uh, we have this kind of interactive mailing list that we can sign up to when we're actively watching, and um, then the uh, you know it alerts us, of course, to when there's uh, problems, and it's so it makes it a lot easier for us to just kind of you know sit there on our laptops, especially if we have to watch on a weekend. We can watch from home. Um, I've actually watched from the beach before on my BlackBerry. It was really cool. Um, and then we have a script that is actually fairly new within the last year that uh, the mail is piped through the script and it sorts mail uh, multiple action items by severity. And so we could have, you know, I can have at the top, for example, you know, these Apache web services are down, which uh, immediately affects the customer. Or at the bottom, I'll be like, well, this load might start be starting to become a problem. So, and it kind of, you know, scales in between. Uh, so version and track. We recently converted from CVS. Uh, CVS is okay. Um, it works perfectly fine, but um, we're getting to start to get to a size where, uh, you know, we have a larger development team than we used to, and uh, Subversion has a lot more features that uh, are kind of necessary. Um, and even when we were at CVS and now it's Subversion, we have a wrapper script that works really nice. So when we put in SVN update or um, when we uh, SVN commit, there's a wrapper script that is initiated, brings up a, a familiar VI interface that's, you know, gets our comments on, you know, what's going on with this commit. We save it. It sends out to a ma uh, another mailing list uh, the, our comments, uh, what tags and branches are, you know, the file and tags in the branch, and, um, you know, sends all the changes and the diff to the mailing list. So everybody on the development team, all the honchos, and all the tech uh, members, people, you know, 
everybody who's uh, an, an admin can see what changes are going on. So if I'm watching at 3 in the morning and all of a sudden all the Apaches start failing, I can go back and see who committed what and say, okay, that, that probably is it right there. And uh, historically, we've used uh, an in-house bug tracking system. And uh, we're still using that right now, but of course, we're going to be moving to track because uh, it kind of makes more sense to have everything integrated. Service control. This is not a familiar name with you guys. This is our in-house uh, automation system. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Did anybody go to that uh, Pearl talk this morning? Yeah, we don't know Tim Tony Bicarbonate. We have no idea who that is. We do use uh, object-oriented Perl, and um, this is why service control has never been released to the public. <laughs> it's, not, uh, it's not pretty, but it works, and uh, it does some really awesome stuff. What we do is whenever we add a machine, uh, at all, you know, whenever we add a machine to our network, it gets put in the database, and then it gets assigned clusters. So our system knows if it's a database machine, if it's a web hosting machine, and what have you. And you know, then you know, our system knows what services are attached to it. Apache services are MySQL. So then all we have to do is run a command that says, you know, do a config, uh, a user config on this machine. And it will go through and iterate through all of the users that are supposed to be on that machine, you know, create the Etsy password and the, uh, the shadow and uh, the other files, and uh, creates all the NFS mounts if it's an NFS mounted machine, uh, changes the group, uh, the changes the you know, CH modes, the uh, directories, and that sort of thing, and pushes all of that out. And it's done like that. So it kind of makes system, it makes system administration a whole lot easier. Another thing that it does is that when uh, a user you know, changes something, like say in the web panel, um, the services get scheduled by adding uh, entries into a database. And then you know, there, in turn, the, the service control runs those commands so that you know, users get, um, they, you know, Account owners can see their users show up almost immediately. They can see, you know, their domain names, you know, automat uh, set up pretty quickly on the on the host machines. Um, one click installs, you know, that's all done through service control. Yes. So is service control kind of like a complete integration management, or is it? It's, it's, I guess that web hosting don't have the, the customers do their configure their instances. So, uh, but this sort of does everything except. Right. Service control itself, it's like a, a hook script. Um, and then there's libraries, uh, Perl libraries that are behind it uh, that are organized uh, into, uh, it, it's really well organized. And again, you know, then what happens when the, the script is run, um, the service control looks at the machine and sees what services it's able to do, whether it's, you know, if it's like if you try to run a MySQL, confi uh, try to config a MySQL service on a, a shared hosting machine that has no MySQL services, it's just going to, you know, error out and say you can't do that. Um, but uh, so it looks up what type of services can be run on the machine and then looks at the command that you're feeding it and then just, you know, looks, you know, goes through the code and, uh, you know, does what it's supposed to do. It's pretty cool. It makes life a lot easier. <laughs> uh, Usage Watch is uh, a service control library. This is my baby. Um, and it has been in development for a bit because things keep changing. But um, it keeps track of user uh, resource usage and progress. We have um, on any shared web hosting system, uh, any host, you're going to have people that um, you know, use more than what they should be on a shared web host, uh, on a shared server. And they're going to be, you know, and their attitude towards it is going to be anywhere from apologetic and helpful to, I'm entitled to use 80% of the system resources. And what this is meant to do is, you know, flex with that sort of thing to help out the people that want to, you know, work with us or, you know, get, you know, get people, you know, to a V server that uh, maybe aren't so helpful so that they can deal with their own problems and not bother anybody else. Um, so, and this is, of course, is all done through a database, and uh, this uh, tech support people can actually uh, send commands to Usage Watch and update their status, and you know everything is tracked in a log. 
web panel. So once again, not that too many people familiar with web panel, I guess. Um, web panel is um, really awesome. It is the one. Re it is really is the number one reason why customers are so happy with us. Um, you can do, I mean, just about anything that you can think of that you can do to a Linux hosting account, you can do through web panel. You don't have, we have customers who know absolutely nothing about Linux who host with us and can do so because of web panel. Uh, we have this, for example, we have this thing where you can uh, go in and we have these one-click installs and you just, you know, click what application you want, for example, WordPress or uh, PHP bulletin board, and say, okay, just install it. You know, if, you, if you want to, you can even make it, you know, be as dumb as not wanting to even deal with the database details. And it installs it for you, and you don't, and you don't have to worry about what's going on in the background. And then the user gets emailed if there's, like, more setup to do, like, if, uh, to go to the actual website and, you know, finish the installation procedure for, like, you know, example, of WordPress. And that's it. And they don't, they don't have to worry about any of the underlying architecture. They don't have to worry about, you know, running any configure files or whatever. Yes? Do you manage the updates for your users? So if um, a new version of uh, PSP board comes out, do you update it? Um, the question is, do we update the version, uh, the, uh, do we upgrade uh, the applications for them. To a certain extent, yes, actually. I actually coded in the capability, like if when somebody ins uh, installs something, um, there is some, uh, a button there to turn on the ability to get notified when there's upgrades, so then people can go to um, the, um, then, you know, can go to the web panel to actually just, and all it is is clicking a button to upgrade me to the latest version, and that's it. Um, but in the future, that is going to be automated so that, because, I mean, we just actually um, had to send out a bunch of emails to people notifying. WordPress is, you know, uh, it's like all, a lot of the old in WordPress uh, versions are really open to cross-site scripting and, you know, SQL injection. And so we had to send an email to everybody, okay, you really need to upgrade this now because this is causing a problem. So you can also add users, domains, edit DNS which is kind of, I don't, I don't know if you've ever, guys have ever done shared hosting, but that's kind of a big deal. Um, adding and edit, uh, editing cron jobs, uh, web FTP, which is kind of cool. I mean, you don't even have to have an FTP client on your computer. You can, you know, upload files through our web interface. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, he's asking me what the uh, advantages of web panel are over uh, cPanel or other systems. Well, for one thing, um, I'm, I'm not familiar with those systems, but um, if you send, uh, we have a, a system through web panel, all of our customers have the ability to send us suggestions. So when anybody uh, asks us to add a new toy to web panel, because it's all built in house, we can do it, you know, we can actually, you know, add uh, features very quickly. Um, a new feature that we actually added was something called DH Apps. Um, it's in beta right now. I asked for invite codes, but unfortunately, I couldn't get any. But um, DH Apps allows people to who don't have DreamHost accounts to get a WordPress blog or uh, PHP BB or a Drupal uh, site set up. So you can use our services, but you don't have to have an account with us. And that's kind of uh, like our gateway drug, I guess. To, uh, to getting an account with us. That's the marketing behind it. So uh, does anybody have any more uh, questions about DreamHost before I move on to Ceph? Yes. Uh, oh, VPS as well. In fact, if you have a DreamHost PS, you can actually uh, reboot your virtual machine using web panel. So you, I, mean, I think you can restart services. I haven't. I, for, I have not played with it as much as I probably should have. Yes. No, actually, we do it routinely. I mean, it's because we have customers who are on shared hosting. They're like, "Hey, I want to be on VPS." 
sign me up. And we're like, okay, and we run a script, and they get sent to VPS. So it's, uh, yeah, it's um, pretty, it, it, it's pretty seamless, actually. I mean, there's no, you know, they don't really, there's not a whole lot of downtime except, I think, for the switching of the IP address, and, you know, which always, of course, you know, is problematic, but you want more toys? <laughs> Gotta suffer a little. <laughs> any, any, anybody? Okay, I think that's it. Ceph. This is uh, probably the main event for some. Ceph is awesome. It is a distributed network file system designed to provide excellent performance, reliability, and scalability. Um, Sage, um, it, it's a um, license under the GPL. And uh, this was developed by Sage Weil, one of the uh, honchos. He um, did it to... Um, as he, it started out as a PhD project. It's partially funded by the Department of Energy. And he basically saw uh, a problem with um, file systems, especially in academic computing. And the problem was is that in a large network where there's you know, petabytes of data, if all of, you know, many users all at once start hitting the same directory or the same file, um, I.O. becomes a problem and this, uh, the system starts suffering and there's performance problems. So he just developed Ceph, uh, Ceph and um, open sourced it. And um, since then, he's actually made it a little bit more generic so that more people can actually use it. Um, just a little bit of a word of warning. Uh, Ceph is under heavy development. I'm here largely to try to get people to uh, hack on it and uh, hammer on it. Um, if you want to deploy it in a production environment, um, you can go ahead and let us know. We're, we can't f fix you know, the fallout from it, but we would love to know the data. So the advantages of uh, Ceph, uh, seamless scaling. Um, basically, what happens is that uh, a Ceph file system can uh, be seamlessly expanded by adding OSDs, objects, uh, storage devices. Yes. Uh, checksum? Um, I think it does that, but I don't think it does it through checksum. I think it does it through another, um, I think there's another function that actually does that. It, um, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it double checks things, but not in that way. Um, so where was I? So unlike um, well, uh, regular file systems, um, they, they actually uh, actively migrates data. Um, uh, it, uh, it intelligently um, migrates data across OSDs. And uh, sorry, hold on just a moment. It, uh, it um, intelligently migrates data across uh, many OSDs. Um, strong reliability and fast recovery. Um, all the data in Ceph is replicated across uh, many disks so that if one disk fails, um, the other disks take, can take over. There's no disks that are wa wasted. For example, we use NetApps right now. So if a disk fails, um, you, you know, we have a spare disk, but then, you know, the, the, there's a lot of I.O. that there's a lot of um, computing involved in actually getting that spare disk up to speed. So that can create a bottleneck. But in Ceph, all the disks are used and it, all the data is replicated across all the disks. So if one disk fails, then, you know, everything keeps on ticking as normal. So uh, adaptive metadata server. The, the Ceph MDS is designed to adapt its behavior. I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I actually don't know that. I, I'm not familiar with uh, the Google. Right. No. Yeah. I, no. We. That's. Yeah. I mean. That's what, why we're migrating. To, why we're migrating users now uh, from our uh, NFS mounted you know, system to local file storage is because it's just plus NFS in you know seems to like in, in our kind of environment NFS kind of breaks down um, unfortunately. Yes. 
mostly for backup, actually, right now, because we, uh, we try to use the Sun X fires uh, for uh, NFS mounting, the NFS mounted data, and found that if our users had, a, you know, a, even a, a little bit more than the average amount of bandwidth usage, it would, it would, you know, it would fall apart. We tried working with Sun uh, on it to see what was going on, but you know, in the end, because our users were getting very impatient with us, we had to return to uh, NetApps because they seem to be the hardiest. And you know, most, I mean, it's like not perfect with the, the NFS mounting, but you know, better than data. Also, with the lo uh, the local file storage, we're able to move to that because uh, we now have uh, people in our Knox that are working there. Uh, not 24-7 yet, but close. So the adaptive metadata server, um, it actually, um, it, again, the data is rep uh, replicated intelligently. <clears throat> um, it adapts its behavior to the current wor workload. Uh, so again, if there is a hotspot of, you know, many people are hitting the same file directory, um, you know, the file or the same directory, uh, it can, you know, replicate that data to uh, other MDSs within the cluster. And that will, you know, improve performance for uh, the clients. And this is done through intelligent disks. So, this is how it works. So in traditional storage, you have an application that talks to the file system. Um, and then the file system accesses the data through dumb disks. However, in Ceph, we have uh, object-based storage. So you have this, the client access the file, um, access the MDS, which, at, which then talks to um, the disks which are turned into object-based storage devices. So here's a simple example of how Ceph works. Uh, the client um, uh, contacts the MDS cluster and requests uh, a file or a directory. The, MD, uh, the MDS then talks to the OSD and says, I need this file, or uh, it, it says, uh, it reads the directory. And from the MDS, it receives uh, a capability as well as, the, um, as well as the object name. That's sent back to the client, and the client then can then from then on out talk to the OSD, talk to the disk, because all it needs is the object name to know where the location is of that data. And that uh, prevents bottlenecks from occurring in the, uh, in the MDS. So then once the client's done with the file, it relinqu relinquishes the capability to the uh, MDS. Yes? Uh, this looks extremely similar to the Sun distributed by system cluster. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll get to that, actually, because there, there are some differences. So, Ceph metadata. Now, conventionally, uh, directory contents, the file names, um, are in block lists, and that's you know usually separate. It's separate from the uh, the data. Uh, in Ceph, we eliminate block lists. Um, the um, the the file um, the it become they become objects. Um, <coughs> So yeah, Ceph so treats data as objects. So uh, and a function is used to uh, distribute uh, data amongst the OSDs. So this makes uh, this makes the inode small and simple. And uh, here can you, you can see actually how this works out. Um, in the tradition in a traditional file system, you have the storage object uh, with the uh, directory entry. And the inodes are separate from that. So um, the, the client has to, you know, uh, it, take, it takes a long time then for the uh, client to find the data. As you can see with Ceph, though, the, um, the, directory, uh, the directory entry and the inodes are stored together. So um, there's less fragmentation. Ceph journaling. So the MDS journal, it records all changes. And it, what it does is it uh, updates, you know, it records each change, but it buffers it. So then the journal, uh, updates to the journal then are all made in one go. <coughs> and the, uh, the journal can get to be up to uh, hundreds of megabytes. 
and this uh, this uh, this buffering um, uh, allows uh, IO um, IO uh, performance to be much better. <coughs> Um, adaptive part, uh, Ceph uses ad uh, adaptive partitioning, which distributes workload across partitions. Um, this is usually done. Ma uh, this is uh, this partitioning is usually done manually by system administrators, but um, if with Ceph, it's done automatically. Uh, here is a graphical representation of what happens when there's a hotspot when any particular directory is accessed by, you know, many users at once. You can see then what happens is the, uh, all, uh, more it's, um, the data is replicated across many MDSs. And this, uh, and that uh, prevents I.O. load. It's a great graph of Ceph's failure recovery. Um, Sage uh, created this from the data that he got uh, when benchmarking uh, Ceph, and this was back in 2007 when he uh, when he actually got this data. So I th I have a f I, this is probably improved, but all he did was shut down the MDS and then waited to see what happened, and within just a few seconds, it recovered itself. Rados. Rados is exciting uh, because this is actually what, this is the, the big thing I think that makes Ceph really, really cool, is that each, each one of these disks is intelligent, and that's what Rados is, is actually it makes the disk in, uh, intelligent. Um, ButterFS, uh, ButterFS is used to handle uh, local object storage, transactions, and synchronization. And then Rados, which stands for Reliable Autonomic Distributed Object Store. And what that does is that it exposes the, um, the object interface and manages consistent replication with peers. Basically what this means is that if you add disks to your cluster, um, the disks will see that, that the, you know, the new disks are there and say, hey, I've got this cluster map. You need, a, you need this, this cluster map to know what you should be doing. And so it immediately, um, and then also when a disk fails, the, di the other disks know that di another disk has failed and they're like, and so um, that's exactly what happens when a, so then the, the replication, the, the data is, you know, so they all have, they know, basically they all know that they should have, uh, they know which data that they need. And um, the exciting thing about all this actually is that uh, the system administrator uh, can take the cluster map, make their own rules, like, you know how when a, file system gets really big, you have to repartition it. You can feed the cluster map those rules, how you want the data to be partitioned. And the disks themselves will actually follow that cluster map. So where is Ceph today? We have working snapshots. Uh, our customers demand snapshots because they do things like delete a file accidentally. And then they uh, email us and say, I need this file. Where, uh, can you recover it for me? And snapshots are great for that. Uh, asynchronous metadata operations, that's great because then uh, that handshake you saw in an earlier slide, uh, so like if a client, for example, is tarring up a file, um, the um, metadata server can um, make two requests to the OSD, and then you know, the OSD will reply. That you can make you know two requests at once. Improve threading, <clears throat> and that's done through um, reducing the data uh, data stack usage. Island scoping is actually what we mean by that is a low level uh, file system check of the object storage layer, and um, an admin can you know tell the system to uh, s scope the entire storage cluster, or just one OSD, or you know the placement group. And then any errors that are from the file system check are recorded to a central log. The future of Ceph. Um, actually, this week, um, I was actually uh, talking to some Debian folks. And they said, um, if you want people, you know, exposure for Ceph, what you should do is get yourself in the experimental repository. And I thought, that's a great idea. And I asked Sage, how, what, how do you feel about this? And his response was, great, I've always wanted to you know, do app get install Ceph. And I'm like, but, but the exposure. 
and but he was um, more excited about the ease of getting stuff installed which actually I've been you know toying around with getting stuff running on my little on my laptop and I, I, I actually agree with him that would be really cool sure I'm sorry Right, exactly. It, there, it, it, there, there is a process for that. I mean, you know, not just building the packages, but you know, there, there's quite a process for it. And we're just starting this. You know, this week we just started researching what we need to do, uh, what the packages need to look like, and that sort of thing. Uh, strong, scalable security is another step that we need to do, and that's. Uh, we need to implement uh, implement node and user authentication, encryption, that sort of thing, and of course stabilization. It's again, it's nowhere near being production ready, and we really yes. Um, it uses libfuse definitely, and yeah, there is a kernel module. Um, there is a, a daemon that it, not a daemon is a, there is a kernel module, so it runs in kernel space, and then we have two daemons that uh, run in user space. And again, yeah, stabilization, and um, so we can let, run it. Sorry. Uh, well, the module is is actually we you know was built by uh, was uh, written by by Sage, so it, it's included with uh, with the build. Pardon? Oh yes. Definitely. Um, if you, um, I'm going to have information on how to get to the wiki. The um, the actually um, getting the source uh, via Git and building it is actually really straightforward. So again, more information. There's uh, Dreamhost.com um, for Dreamhost blog.dreamhost.com, which is actually very amusing. Um, the blog is mostly written by uh, our own, um, our honcho Josh, and I don't know if you have, any of you have ever received a Dreamhost newsletter. We, you know, we have people who love our newsletters. We have people who absolutely hate them because they just want to get the information that they don't uh, want somebody you know, also talking about baseball scores. And it's just like you haven't met Josh. <laughs> so, and um, you can also get information like we had something interesting go on with that where we had, um, I don't know if you, any of you were around for um, when we had multiple power outages and our entire network went down at the time. And uh, you were there? That was painful. And uh, once everything was said and done, or not everything was said and done, but Josh actually went on the, on the blog and laid out everything that happened to us and why it was happening and what we were doing to try to, you know, you know, make sure it never happened again. Yes? Pardon? Right now, what we're testing it on, believe it or not, are co-rates. So, you know, just like a, a blade server and a disk array. To start out? Yeah. Object storage uh, devices? You can have as many, a little or as many as you want. Right. Um, I I've run it off of this. Uh, the client, the, well, the, well, the client. I've tried to actually get the you know ob object storage devices. You know, like because it, it, you can do it like in a way that um, like vir you can actually get like virtual OSDs going if you really want to. Something like yeah. If, I mean, if you, I mean, you could have one client, one M one MDS, and one you know disk rate array if you wanted. I mean, that that would probably be a, the ideal environment. Just I mean, I mean, the, the minimum ideal environment would probably be that. Yes, sir. Does this replace NFS, and, uh, or does it claim to do more than replacing NetApps? I mean, is it it's aiming to replace the NetApps, or aiming to do? Uh, uh, it's the aim is to be. A, the aim is to. Pardon? How do locks work? Um, I'm not exactly sure, actually. Um, 
um, it, that would probably uh, that would be on uh, self.newdream.net. And if it's not on there, I highly recommend uh, joining the mailing list that is at self.newdream.net because um, the mailing list is actually the the, um, the traffic on it is rather low, but uh, Sage is extremely um, receptive. He's very responsive. And he's actually really, he's really good to work with. So is it, is it mainly to uh, replace NFS? Uh, yes, because NFS. Yeah, sorry, no, okay. NFS is part of your 4.1 in the So it's safety to open source value, but <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. How do you perform backups and steps? Backups? Um, I mean, all the data is replicated across all the disks. What if you fire a directory by accident and accident that could replication? I believe that, would, that would, the snapshots would take care of that then. Because, again, cause again uh, cause, I mean, users do that all the time. And that's what that's why we have the snapshots. We uh, it's like there's two there's two hourlies and then a week uh, a nightly and then a weekly snapshot usually. Yeah, and I mean and it deals with it automatically. Sage actually demoed this for me, and it was incredible just how easily the snapshots were set up. I mean, you just like set up, set up the snapshot uh, immediately, and the LSEs you know know just from. Um, the, um, the just from I think the file name, it automatically knew that that, that was a snapshot, and it started making the snapshot. Offside backups? Um, no, well, that, I mean that's I mean it's it's the file system. I mean the offside backups. That's something that I think is usually um, a, a per company policy. You know, that's usually I don't yeah I, I don't think that's no, that's not really what I think this is meant to do. Um, that's you would have to set something else up. That's that's not that's outside of the scope of what Ceph does. I'm sorry. Did somebody over here have a question? Uh, I believe I believe yeah. I think he just actually posted to the front page of the news of Ceph.newdream.net um, that uh, he started uh, that uh, he was working with POSIX. Yes. No, no, <laughs> no, no, no. We would, we would, uh, um, we would get many angry emails. I believe. As it is, I mean, it's just like as it is. We, if we, if a customer has like five minutes of downtime, sometimes we get a, f a flood of very angry emails. So. No, we, I mean, it's, we, I mean, we, uh, something has to be really tested and proven before we'll use it in a uh, DreamHost production environment because uh, less emails mean, um, less tech support means happier tech support employees. Yes? We've got um, uh, quite a few in that, uh, mm -hmm. No, it's this is you no. Know, I think what this is meant to do. I'm not exactly sure. Oh, actually, that's right. Because uh, NetApps are they use a proprietary system solely, don't they? Yeah, it is. Um, I wouldn't just yet because again, this is you know, heavy development. Um, I mean, if you want to, you know, get some. Uh, you want to get a RAID array and start playing around with it, I, I highly encourage that, and that would be very welcome, but, you know, don't start ditching your current uh, infrastructure. <laughs> Not quite yet. I'm hoping, I might, it would be really awesome if I came back next year and, and said, you know, stuff is ready to go, here's a demo. Yes? So, so when the stuff, uh, the side? Um, I think uh, he, so papers, uh, concept papers started showing up in 2004. Um, and again, um, this was part of uh, Sage's uh, PhD thesis at first, and um, it kind of grew from there because there really is a need for it. 
And he, um, so he, he just recently, I think within the last peer, uh, year, got his PhD and brought stuff to beta. Yes? Um, the state of the documentation, um, again, he has a wiki uh, that's up. Um, there is, there's it, I mean, it's just, it's, um, a, a, like, a, like I said, a, a pretty, uh, the, the, it's a GPL project that is, you know, follows fairly standard procedure of, you know, trying to document everything pretty well. And again, there is a, a, a really good mailing list where, you know, I picked up a lot of stuff, so. Anyone else? Questions? Thank you very much for your attention.